Well, good morning, church. We are in the second week of this teaching series, Under the Hood, where just like you might pop the hood of a car to see what makes it go, we are popping the hood of our church to talk about the values that put our mission into motion. I like that. Um, and, you know, we, we know that, you know, you could, find, you could find an old car and you could take it to, I mean, the best auto body shop on the planet. You could get every dent and dink taken out. You could give it a new paint job. And you could make it look really good. But if it's got issues under the hood, you're going to have a hard time making it do what it is really supposed to do, and that's drive. And in kind of the same way as, as a church, you know, we can, we can have nice buildings, we can have lots of events on the calendar, but, but it's our values that, that are underneath all of that that make us go. We, we have a mission here at SCC, and it's to pursue Jesus wholeheartedly. It's to love people transformationally. And, you know, as great as a building is, as great as events are, it's it's our values that we're talking about in this series. Those are what are going to bring those words to life. Now, I mentioned this last week that um, you know, many in our church are already living out these values. And, and I hope that nothing about this series comes across as like browbeating or anything like that. Like, I just want to encourage you. We would not be who we are without you. Keep going. Keep growing in these things. Others, though, I know are, are kind of sitting on the sidelines of our church a little bit. And the thing is, there are seasons for that. When you are new to a place or a group of people, or maybe when you've been hurt in your spiritual journey along the way and you need some time to heal, like it's okay to, to be on the sidelines. It's okay to just kind of want to figure out what this group of people is about. But I also I want to encourage you pretty unashamedly that we would love for you to, to come all the way in with us. We would love to see you make a commitment to a church family and join us in these values. If you, if you don't do that, I mean, we still love you. There's still going to be a seat here for you. But I hope that you're going to see in this series from, from God's word that he has something more for each of us when we jump in as a part of a family of faith. And so God's Word, that's, that's where we started last week when we talked about our value of biblical authority. You know, we believe that the Bible is God's Word. We believe that it is without error sharing with us the message of Jesus that we need to know, and so we we want to seek to understand the Bible as a church. We want to align our lives with it. We want to share it with others. Now, the value that we're going to talk about today, our next value, is our value of spirit-filled worship. And I'll frame it to you like this. You know, a few months ago, I was here in the church office. I think it was like a Tuesday evening and had wrapped up my work day, walked out to our family's minivan and stuck the key in the ignition, turned it, and nothing. One of our elders, he happened to be here doing some stuff, and so he pulled his car over next to mine, and, and we tried to give it a jump, and still, nothing. So I had to make a trip to the store and, and pick up a new battery, and I brought it over here, and I got it installed, and sure enough, with that, the van started right up. So, if somebody could tell me, just later, why it is my, my car has a gas gauge to let me know when I'm, I'm about to run out of fuel, and like my refrigerator at home, it has a little alert whenever I need to change the water filter, but there's no indicator telling me, hey, your battery is about to strand you at the office, you should probably change it. You know, it feels like there should be a way to be slightly more informed about such an essential component of my car. Because without that power, my car's not going to go anywhere. And friends, if, if we're going to live out our mission at SCC, 
we need to value our connection to God's source of power for us, which is His Holy Spirit. In the book of John, chapter 14, Jesus told His followers, If you love me, you will keep my commands. Plug that right into what we talked about with biblical authority last week. And then in verse 16, he says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the Spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him. But you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. Now, you know how a lawyer is sometimes called a a counselor by judges on TV shows? That's That's the context that Jesus uses, this Greek word, counselor. He's talking about a legal advocate, and an advisor, a helper. And, you know, I I spent a year in law school. I don't have time to get into the whole thing. Kind of was running away from what God's plan for my life was. But I I spent a year there, and during my time, I think each of my professors took a moment to point out that you should never serve as your own lawyer in any situation. Uh, the, The saying goes that a person who represents him or herself has a fool for a lawyer and a client. The the idea is that that you rarely are going to have the expertise in your own situation, or honestly just be able to see clearly and objectively your own situation to be able to do that. And when it comes to our relationship with God, when it comes to things of eternal significance, we are just way out of our depth. We need help knowing what's right in God's eyes. We need help seeing clearly things that have been so muddied by sin. And so Jesus says, God is going to send you a counselor, an advocate, someone to advise you, someone to speak on your behalf. Actually, what Jesus says is that God is going to send you another counselor because Jesus himself was the first one. Jesus came and he, he fleshed out the, the, the truths that we needed to know about God, how much we needed him, how, how our sin makes us guilty in, in his eyes. And so Jesus, he, he advised his followers on how to live rightly before God. But more importantly than that, Jesus stood before our righteous judge And when we were declared guilty for our sin, Jesus took that guilty verdict on himself. He died to pay for our sins. And then he rose again, showing that he was God, fully in power. And what Jesus does now is he sits in heaven and he advocates on our behalf. If you are a follower of Jesus, like when you sin again because you do and you will, Like when we sin, Jesus is sitting there advocating, saying, no, see that one, I I covered that. That one's been paid for. But during his time on earth, Jesus, he had some limits. And don't go heresy hunting on me or anything. He did. He, he was fully God. And I mean, we see him perform miracles that are, that are honestly hard for us to wrap our heads around. But he was also fully human. Like he put that limitation on himself to only exist in a single place at a, at a single point in time. You know, he, he limited himself to only being able to have conversations with people who were in his immediate area. So if you needed counsel from Jesus, you either had to be there with him or you had to wait. As, as the second person of our triune, our three-in-one God. Jesus was God's personal presence among us. But the Holy Spirit, this counselor that Jesus promised his disciples to send, he would be God's personal presence within us. The third person of our 
triune God. He is not bound by the limits of humanity. He is fully God with and in every Christian all the time. He's the spirit of truth. Jesus says. He's able to guide us in what is right and what is good and what is wise. He's able to advocate for us, defend us against the accusations of of Satan and demons, our spiritual enemies, when they come in telling us that we're not good enough, that God doesn't love us, that he hasn't accepted us. The Holy Spirit can stand in our defense. The Holy Spirit empowers Jesus' followers to to live for Him and to live like Him in a way that we couldn't otherwise. He can give us strength to say no to sin. He can help us overcome our our worry and and our disappointments in life. He can help us understand and recall the Bible. And and it's And it's His power that reaches other people for Jesus. When when we do anything and and someone's heart or mind or eternal destiny is changed by it, that's not us. That's the the power of the Holy Spirit at work through us. All of that is what the Holy Spirit can do, what He is able to do. But, just because He can do all of those things, doesn't mean that every Christian experiences them. It's like this. Uh, I've, I've seen commercials for vacuum cleaners that are powerful enough to pick up bowling balls. Or for uh, laundry detergents that are powerful enough to remove red wine stains. Which is all fine and good, but unless... I personally use a vacuum cleaner to pick up a bowling ball or use a detergent to get out such a tough stain. It's kind of irrelevant to me. Experiencing the full potential of something's power, or in the case of the Spirit, the full potential of someone's power, it's often dependent on you wanting to experience that, you choosing to experience that, you doing what it takes to experience that. Did you know that it is possible to have the Holy Spirit in you and not be especially filled by Him? If you are saved by Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in you at all times. He has indwelt you. And Trust me, if he decided to like come on you in his power in this moment, you would have about as much say in that as when a big wave catches a hold of you at the beach and takes you for a ride. But the book, book of First Thessalonians tells us that we are actually able to quench the Spirit by, by throwing a wet blanket on a campfire. Ephesians 4 tells us that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. In the book of Acts, we see followers of Jesus who had the Spirit in them at different times be filled more by the Holy Spirit. So we know that those two things are are not one and the same. I'd explain it kind of like this. You know, when when you were a teenager, or if you are still a teenager, you know, you you are likely still lived in the home with your parents, one or, or both of your parents, you, you were in their presence regularly. But as a teenager, that's often the time in life when, when many of us start making decisions about how much influence our parents are going to have in our lives. When it comes to the Holy Spirit, it's being filled with Him. It's not just about being in His presence It's about whether you're making decisions to be increasingly influenced by His presence. And that's what we want. When we say that we value Spirit-filled worship at SCC, we're we're saying that, that we seek to experience more of the Holy Spirit. In our devotion to God, like personally our devotion, and 
in our engagement with each other, with what we experience together as a church family. We're, we want to value going after that. Now, there are a couple of things that I do want to be sure I'm clear about. Whenever we talk about worship, we don't mean just singing. Singing is one act of worship, but our value is about a much broader response to God than just that. You know, worship is our response to who God is and what God has done with all that we are and all that we do. Romans chapter 12 Verse 1 says, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, because of all He has done for you, I urge you to present your bodies, your whole life and being, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Now, it's not just songs, it's not just offerings, even though those are parts of it, but our whole lives are an opportunity for worship. And we, here at this church, we want to live that out in an increasingly spirit-filled, spirit-influenced way. Now, that's another term that there can be a little bit of misconception about. Spirit-filled. Now, I know that some hear that, that conjures up images of people like shaking like they're in some sort of trance or I don't know maybe people like dancing through the aisles of the church or, or or people like falling over because the tv preacher starts swinging around his suit jacket right and, and, and some of you are like I, I have no desire to be a part of a church like that some of you say man that'd be kind of awesome to be part of a church like that <laughs> and I want to be clear spirit-filled does not mean hyper-expressive now, sometimes the Spirit does move in someone so much that like, they shake, or they dance, or they even fall down before God. And there are people who clap. There are people who raise their hands. There are some people who give vocal response to the preaching of God's Word. There are some people who give give response to, to prayer whenever truths are being spoken. And for others, spirit-filled looks like an inward reflection. It looks like a silent meditation. For some, it is deep study. For some, it is writing, like, like can't write fast enough note-taking. For some, it's just a, a quiet tear rolling down the cheek. And, and all of that, I mean, that's, that's all just activities that might happen in a setting like this. That doesn't even mention the spirit-filled worship of serving other people. It doesn't mention the, the spirit-filled worship of generosity, other things that we're going to touch on in this series. And I'll tell you, church, like, for a long time, I used to think that worship needed to look in everyone the way that, that God leads me to worship. But the further I walk down this Christian following Jesus journey, the less judgmental I find myself of how the Spirit might be filling others in their worship. The important thing is that we value Him as, as one of your pastors, I have a responsibility to challenge you. If you are a follower of Jesus and you aren't asking, seeking, expecting the Spirit to show up in greater measure in your life and in your church experience. I mean, sadly, there are, there are probably some very expressive displays of worship that are, that are fake. Because, because the person has been shown, oh, this is what spirit-filled worship looks like, but they haven't really been taught to connect with him. And there are probably just as many, if not more, passionless, passive churchgoers because they have never been instructed to seek the filling of the Spirit or 
They just are choosing to settle for a lesser experience for themselves and for their church. You know that that minivan with the bad battery I told you about? Uh, we bought that minivan a little over 10 years ago. We, uh, we didn't plan on becoming a minivan family, but then we found out we were having twins along with the kid that we already had, so we became a minivan family. And when we were looking for it, we, uh, we sat in other minivans that more or less looked the same. And ultimately, they would have got us from A to B the same. But they were so much different in terms of experience. Like, we sat in the, in the lowest trim level of that minivan where it was like it didn't have power windows, it didn't have power doors, it just had AM, FM radio. I'm pretty sure you had to get outside and crank the thing to start it up. But then, you know, then we sat in like the deluxe model, you know, with the one that had like the, the full navigation system in the front and this like full entertainment system going on behind us. And I, I'll never forget this. This thing had a cool box. Have you seen one of these things? Where it's like they've got a little compartment in the car that actually will like keep your leftovers and, and stuff like cool in the car on the drive home, right? Like... Same looking car, but we're talking two completely different experiences of the same vehicle. Now, you know, we couldn't afford it because remember, twins, but, um, you know, we got to see and we got a a picture of what the high life was like. (laughs) Church, valuing spirit filled worship is about not settling for the lowest trim level experience of your salvation. Yes, we are saved by the grace of Jesus, not by what we experience afterwards. And yes, ultimately what we are looking forward to in Jesus isn't what's going to happen here in this life, but the eternity that's waiting for us. But God has a taste of that available to us in the here and now in ever-increasing measure, if we would seek Him for it. And He even tells us how to do that. If you want to look with me at Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 15. The Apostle Paul, he writes to this church, he tells them, pay careful attention then to how you walk. Not as unwise people, but as wise making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. You want to know how to be more spirit-filled? Well, here's a guide. On a personal level, pay attention to how you are living. These are evil days, so don't think that you can just go about your business like everybody else out there is doing. You know, same priorities as them, same entertainment as them, same spending as them, and think that you're being wise. You need to know what the Lord's will is. Know your Bible. Understand what God has to say about your morals, about your treatment of others. And don't get hammered, Paul says. <laughs> don't give yourself over to the influence of a substance that is going to take away your control. You probably go even so far as to say, don't give yourself over to anything that is going to become the controlling influence of your life. Because sometimes that's not alcohol. Sometimes that's a job or a hobby or a political allegiance. You should choose one controlling influence in your life, and that is the Holy Spirit. And Paul says you will increase his influence. You will be more filled with him. When you get together with your church family and and speak truths of scripture to one another, 
When you make music together, when you sing songs to him, you'll increase his influence when you are intentionally thankful for all of God's blessings. You'll increase his influence when you submit to one another. You'll have more of the Spirit filling you when you place the needs of your brothers and sisters above your own, when you serve them, when you're generous to them, when you pray for each other. Being filled with the Spirit, it's, it's both this very personal and this very group-oriented event in, in how we're called to seek Him and how we're going to experience all that He has for us. I'll tell you, when, when a church is going through a really healthy season, it's usually because a critical mass of people there are striving to be Spirit-filled in both their personal devotion and in their engagement with their fellow believers. They they gather and they sing and they pray and they learn and they serve. And all of these things are not an afterthought. They are a steady commitment to Christ and to this church family. And you don't find many healthy, growing Christians or healthy, growing churches where The mindset is, well, yes to worship and yes to my church family if I'm not too busy with other things. Yes to worship and my church family unless I had a really rough Saturday. I'm not saying like we lose Jesus because of those things, but you are going to get a far lesser experience in life than the Holy Spirit could give you if you were seeking Him just the way we read about. My brother, my sister, who is is struggling with the strength to resist sin, or who finds yourself racked with fear about the future, or who can never seem to find the words to tell that person you care about, about Jesus, are you connected to the power of the Spirit as God's Word just laid out how we can be. And friends, it's not, it's not just about church attendance. I don't even like that phrase, church attendance. Because we can, we can show up here. You can be very consistent in being in the gathering of the church. Some gather and are very disengaged whenever they do. You know, you're around your brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and well, quite frankly... And this is just from, you know, many years of experiencing it myself personally and seeing it in the lives of others. We tend to experience more of the influence of the Spirit the more we, we want to get the influence of the Spirit. It's one of those you, you get out of it what you put into it kinds of things. It, when you're here, I mean, if you say, well, singing isn't really my thing, music's not really my thing, so I just sort of check out while the music is going on. I, just kind of, I stand up because it would be weird if I didn't stand up. I just kind of glaze over and just kind of wait for that time to be over. Or if you, you know, if you, if you hear um, the, the message, like maybe you love the music and you say the group's singing, that's what I can't get anywhere else, but you know the message is up there when Todd's preaching or Ray's preaching or Ryan's preaching, like I can hear better speakers online anytime, which that by itself, that's not a terrible thing to think. I hear better speakers than me online all the time. But whenever our, our mind is just like, oh, I get that little vibration in my pocket, and so, so that's now where my attention is going to be, or that little red circle next to my messages or my emails, it got bigger, so that's where my focus is. You're almost always going to get out of worship what you put into worship. And that's not me passing the buck. Like, there are times that I need to be clearer up here. There are times whenever... You know, the, the lyrics that we're worshiping with, or maybe the music, it's not connecting with what it is you came in going through. I'm, I'm saying that it's about all of us. It's about church leaders. It's about the church family all together seeking to experience the Spirit. Like, I know that you can engage with music that doesn't necessarily hit your musical sweet spot. And you want to know how I know that? Doc McStuffins. Some of you guys don't know Doc McStuffins. Doc McStuffins 
takes care of her stuffed animal toys on a preschool TV show that my kids watched whenever they were that age, and she sings a lot. I never cared once what that little girl was singing to her stuffed animals, but you know who did care? My kids. So I chose to engage with them, and you know what? Now I can sing Doc McStuffin songs in my sleep, and they haven't watched it in years. <laughs> Like We can choose to engage because we see the value. And I'm just asking us, church, like if you are committed to the movement of the Spirit in your church family, engage with the music just the best that you can. You don't have to check out. I know that we can engage with teachers who, who aren't you know, always clicking with us. And I know that because most of us passed a class in school with a teacher and a subject that we did not like. Again, I, 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 I want to always strive to help you feel engaged. I, I, I try my hardest to help us with that every week. But, but church, this isn't just about me. This is about any teacher of the Bible you might sit under. We can cut the distractions of our phones. We can take notes and, and try to engage. We can do what we need to do under any teaching to seek what God's Spirit has for us. And, and if I'm being just very straightforward with you all, spirit-filled worship takes more than just the 60 or 70 minutes that we get in this room. I, I, I'll go so far as to say it's, it's going to be nearly impossible for you to share this value of our church if the only time and the only way you connect with this church family is here during this time what we do in this time, it is right, it is good, but it is not everything. You know, we need environments where more than just the most hurting among us ask for and receive prayer. We need to be in places where we are applying and discussing the truths of Scripture with one another, not just hearing them talked at you from up here. We need to be in places where we are together seeking God for healing on spiritual, emotional, and physical levels, where we are seeking what words God might have for us in our particular situations. And we, we need to serve one another in the ways that God empowers all of us to. We're going to talk about this a lot more next week, but the Holy Spirit actually gifts each follower of Jesus specifically with a way for them to serve their church body, that family of believers, not to just be passive consumers because church for us consists of this hour here. One of our hopes you know, coming out of this series is that there are some who will make a commitment or maybe a recommitment to church membership. And church membership, it's one of those kind of kind of awkward topics to talk about because I can't tell you, hey, open up to the book of Colossians and we'll read the whole section that tells you all about church membership. It's, you don't find it in there like that. What we find in Scripture are these commitments, these committed lives that Christians lived toward one another. And church membership is, is one of the structures that we put around to help us with that. And, and we, we, we want to see more people taking on that group accountability where we want to value the authority of the Bible together and value spirit-filled worship together and these other things and that, that we would make a commitment to experience them more together because we don't want to settle for the bare minimum experience of our faith. And we talk about church membership because we don't want to demand this of anyone who has not said, yeah, I want to throw my hat into the ring with that because it's, it's a big call. But for those of you who should be, and, and we trust that the Spirit is going to impress that on you, we, we do want more of us to make that commitment because of how much more we'll experience from God in the long run when more of us do. And so, friends, I just, I would ask you to be praying about that. You know, what kind of commitment do you have to this church family or to any church family if it's not here? 
does it look like the kind of individual and group effort to be filled by the Spirit that we read about in Ephesians chapter 5? We're going to move into a time of communion now, and I want to give you an opportunity to reflect on that. If you are a follower of Jesus, every week we gather, we take the bread, we drink from the cup that reminds us of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And it's a time for us to just beeline to the cross and thank him for his grace that we are far from perfect, but that he, man, he, he took all of our imperfections on himself. We've got the elements for communion on tables in the back of the room. If you didn't get a chance to grab them on your way in after I pray, you're welcome to jump up and grab those. But I want to encourage you too, if you are a follower of Jesus, that you would just be praying and asking, Lord, am I experiencing a a continued growth in my walk with you, Jesus, and with my church family? Or have I kind of stalled out? Am Am I seeking to experience more help in my worry, more strength to resist sin, more power to share the gospel in the ways that you have given me? Am I seeking a spirit-filled worship? I'm going to pray, and then I just want to invite you to take some time reflecting in that. And then just so that everyone is ready, we we backloaded our, our music time of worship a little bit today. There are going to be a couple more songs than what we normally have after the message. I just wanted you to be mentally ready for that, um, that we wanted to give you an opportunity to maybe have a little more time of reflection if you just need to kind of sit down and spend time in prayer or a little more time singing if what you need is a response to worship and some of what you've heard today or to grab somebody and just ask them if they would pray with you too. We wanted to give a little more space for that this morning. So let's pray. Father God, we love you and we thank you for your word. We continue to recognize today, Lord, that The Bible is our authority. We want it to be what we seek to align our lives to. And Lord, today in your word, as as we see these truths about your Holy Spirit coming to counsel and advocate for us, to help us, give us the power that we need to live for you, Jesus, I pray. I pray that we would be people who would seek to experience more of you, Holy Spirit, in our personal lives and together as a church family. Lord, you know where each one of us is at today. Lord, you know how we walked in here and where we were at in our relationship with you. So Holy Spirit, I I pray that you would just meet each of us where we were at and that you would give us that prompt of that next thing, that next step we need to take, Lord, to, to just be more filled, more influenced by you in our lives. We thank you, Jesus, for the cross. We thank you that our salvation doesn't rest on what we do, but on what you did for us. And it is in your loving name that we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.